All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is a defense in depth talk, uh, mostly talking about building networks, a little bit of a different take. I'm a network engineer, so I'm not necessarily, you can't hear me? Okay. I'm a network engineer, so I'm a bit of a, not really on the security side so much. Um, so I'm going to be talking about building networks. A uh, little bit about me. Um, like I said, I'm not necessarily a security guy. Uh, a lot of what I do, uh, I try to incorporate security into it, but I'm not a security professional in and of itself. Uh, my name is Jason. Um, I'm the senior network engineer for Lafayette College in Pennsylvania. Um, been there about four, a little over four years now. Um, my first talk was actually uh, last month at uh, DerbyCon. So um, this was kind of a on a whim thing. DerbyCon I went to in 2011 it was uh, quite interesting and kind of just decided I was going to talk. Um, helped me get a little bit more uh, uh, faith in myself, if you will. Uh, forces me to learn some stuff. So um, I'm here to learn like everybody else. So let's start off with uh, a little bit of a story. So back in the day, uh, now I'm one of those pre-1986 people, so uh, we had networks that weren't connected to anything because the internet didn't really, I mean, it existed, but nobody was on it. So you'd have just your, your normal uh, ethernet style networks. Uh, back then it was token ring or decknet or you know, whatever other technologies they were using. And it was all self-contained. Nobody needs to worry about anything here. Uh, hackers weren't really able to get into the system. You might have had a modem to dial up to something, but typically it was all closed. Uh, and then um, something happened. Uh, this thing came out called the internet. And um, so we connected to it because we decided it was a great way to get all this connectivity uh, to everybody else in the world. Um, we revolutionized business, and it has, um, but everybody else connected too. So all of the attackers decided that they could now get into your network, and they did. Um, this is a bit of a problem. So we responded, and they responded, and we responded, and, uh, and the race was on. So we started going in with uh, firewalls and routers and DPI and WAFs and traffic shaping, and, and it got more and more and more expensive. So this has been going on for years. And for networks that have existed for long periods of time, uh, a lot of this stuff is bolted on. So nobody went in and said, if we started off with nothing, how would we build this? A lot of people have just said, wait, we, we need a, a firewall here, and just thrown it in front of it. And the firewall's not doing enough, so let's throw an IDS there. And well, that didn't work, because now I have to watch it, so let's use an IPS instead. Uh, and then, you know, that's not working, so now we have WAFs and DLP and, and all this other good stuff. So what would happen if we started with a clean slate? What could we do differently to build our networks um, in such a way that maybe they were secure from the start? Are there any design principles we can use? Um, is there anything earth-shattering here that we can, we can just look at our, our, you know, how the networks are built before, rebuild them now, and then just have something secure from the start without having to get into all of the expensive toys. Um, so that's what this talk is. Uh, so we're gonna start off with some basic principles. Um, any network, uh, or any decent sized network, I mean, we're talking a little bit more than your, your home here. Um, any decent sized network should have some form of redundancy and resiliency. Uh, we wanna make sure that this network that we're building stays up because if it goes offline, we've kind of defeated the purpose of having it. Um, one thing we're going to talk about is network segmentation, when it's usable, uh, how deep we should we go with network segmentation, uh, the principle of least privilege, um, and then our monitoring security. Um, these are all related principles um, in one way or another. They're all going to get us to that end goal. And for the most part, all of this with just generic networking gear is already available. Um, and then anything else beyond that that you want to put in here is usually available as open source. Um, those fancy toys come in handy, but you need to make sure that you need them and you know what they're for and, 
and how to put them into your network before you start throwing money everywhere. So if we start off with redundancy and resiliency, um, redundancy is, is basically duplication of uh, the components, the critical components that you're dealing with in a network or in uh, a car or you know, any, any type of system. Um, the idea is that if one of them breaks, you have another one to take over. Uh, resiliency, on the other hand, is building a system in such a way that it stays running. Even though something failed, you still want that system to be able to continue running. They go hand in hand. One doesn't mean the other. Um, they're both necessary. So if we start off with a system like this, um, it's pretty simple. You've got a single connection to the internet. You've got a single connection to your internal network. Lots of point of failures. Um, the Least, least expensive method of starting to get to where you're more redundant, more resilient, is just add another connection. And you can do that on the outside, and you can do it on the inside. So now you have connections on the outside and inside, uh, but you still have those sing single points of failure, and there's a lot of them. Um, I mean, just from the, the image, you can see you have the router in the middle. Um, that goes away, you've lost everything. Uh, but there's more than that. So these links that you have that go to the internet, or the links that even go to your internal network, are they connected to, or are they in the, the so for your internet links, so did they go to the same provider? Um, are they in the same, did they take the same path out of the building? I mean, if a backhoe comes out front and hits that line, are you done? Um, these are all things that you need to think about. Um, you know, the, the glaring piece here is the router, so of course you can just add another one. Routers are, depending on what you're getting, is expensive. Um, but depending on what your business is, it may be worth it. So you have to take into account all of your business processes and everything else. So this gets us further down the road to a, a redundant system. Um, you still have other issues. These routers, are they in the same location? Um, if your building burns down, how are you gonna survive? I mean, you, these are, you put a router in a different location, how do you get between the two buildings? Um, Let's see, uh, routing, uh, routing through the network itself, you've got different types of routing protocols. Um, how do we deal with uh, uh, making sure that the traffic is going to the correct location? Um, how, do we, we, uh, how do we deal with the security of those protocols, et cetera? Um, and this is only our core network infrastructure here. So you still have all of that internal network stuff to deal with. You can extend your redundancy, but it, there's usually a limit. So once you start pushing out towards the server end, the desktop end, you get to the point where it's gonna get really expensive really fast. I mean, you can make a, a desktop machine that's pretty resilient, quite redundant, but you're talking about multiple, uh, multiple hard drives, multiple ethernet jacks. Um, I mean, you've got, you're gonna have to run some sort of uh, a high availability protocol on it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that can be done, but there is a, a breaking point at which it's just too expensive to go on. So, um, this would get us at least out to the desktop port of part of it in a, in a fairly redundant way. Um, on the server side, it's a little bit different. I mean, those are services that you want to keep up and running for long periods of time. Um, so, at that point, you you do get into a little bit more expense, and, and servers are generally built to be more resilient. Um, so one thing I failed to mention is that this is a uh, intended to be a, a, an interactive talk. So uh, if you have thoughts and ideas as we go through here, um, start shouting them out. Um, so what other areas do we have that we can look at for redundancy, resiliency, et cetera? Um, any suggestions, any, any thoughts? The software side itself. Okay, so your application. So if you're dealing with, uh, say, a web application, um, you can do some sort of high availability, uh, maybe a proxy in front of it, caching system, that sort of that sort of uh, setup. Um, databases and whatnot, they have high availability uh, setups for that. Um, some things that people don't think about. Um, you know, this past uh, this past week was a little rough with the uh, the hurricane. Um, so some of the stuff that, that came up for us uh, that we were looking at is, is uh, power. Power is a 
kind of important for all of these electronic devices that we have. So how do you deal with uh, redundant power? A um, number of years ago, I worked for an ISP uh, who did pretty good with the, the power. They had their generators, they had their UPSs, all was great and wonderful. Went through a point in time, a uh, pretty rough winter, uh, knocked out the power, and the generators wouldn't start. Full gas, generators have been tested, run, the whole nine yards. Turns out the, the fuel lines were frozen. So how do you deal with uh, situations like that where you have, you have everything in place? Everything works, it's tested on a fairly regular basis, but suddenly you have like a unique weather condition where the temperature drops and it's frozen. Right, so these are all things that need to be thought about. Um, the, uh, see the Fukushima accident? Do we know why the, uh, the backup generators weren't running there? because the generators were too low and the water and all that other good stuff was going on. So they, everything was in place, but there were, there were deficiencies that prevented it from happening. So uh, looking at, you know, depending on what your business is and which direction you need, you know, how, how expensive it is to be offline, you may have to go those extra couple of miles to get that, that extra redundancy in the system. Uh, network segmentation. So, um, traditionally, it was take all of your users, throw them on a, a network segment, throw your servers over there on a network segment, and then connect the internet middle, and off you went. Um, as we've, we've learned since then, especially with uh, adding security into this, you want to start segmenting your network into different areas. Now, uh, for our particular um, network, we try to segment into, um, on the user side, we're segmenting into uh, user types. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this, um, a lot of different technologies that, that are used to do this. Uh, we happen to use uh, NAC and 802.1x for this. Um, it used to be that you would actually go down and program the, the Ethernet jack itself. Um, those days are happily long gone. Um, so. One of, the, uh, one of the reasons you do this is so that you don't have problems where your salespeople can get into your engineering network or your, your marketing people think they're, they're great and they start getting into the tech support stuff. Um, and you can do uh, security based on these, these different roles. So what we have is you plug your, your system in, you authenticate to the network, you're put into whatever role you're in, and then you have a basic level of access control based on what network you're in. And we do the same thing on the server side. So we have uh, different areas for um, our web servers base, or our, our DMZs or you know, security servers, management, et cetera. Um, everything is currently segmented on uh, access and role, um, but that's you know, pretty simple to change. So when you're doing network segmentation, there's a number of questions that you can ask um, to identify where uh, systems need to, to, to live. Um, you know, where, where, does that, where does that system belong? Um, is it a web server? Should it belong in the web cluster? Maybe you're dealing with some sort of web service that's internal only. Well, if that's the case, you have a cluster of web servers over here that are for outside access, all your internet users and whatnot are there. Uh, maybe you don't want that internal system there. Maybe you should have a different network segment for that. Um, and that you know, also identifies what sort of access it needs. So uh, we have a number of servers that don't need internet access. So those go into RFC 1918 space, which is just all your private addresses. So without NAT, they don't go anywhere. Um, and then how do you decide where it goes? Well, at the end of the day, if you don't have a location for that to go in, you kind of have to decide whether it's worth the time or the effort to make a new network. So if you have some sort of new service that doesn't fit into these roles that you already have, you can build that new network, which is, is fine, that you know, you're, you're given that ability, but you don't want to take it too far. I mean, there's, there's, there's a limit to how many networks you really want to have to manage. Um, 
this can act as your, your first line of defense. Um, your network segmentation is, I mean, the, the intention is to have firewalls between all of your different networks. So if you craft it the right way, those firewalls are going to take out the attack traffic for most of your common services. So if your, your, desktop, uh, your desktops, for instance, um, in our particular network, the firewall doesn't let anything get back to them. So there is no outside traffic coming to those desktops. Whereas in our DMZ, we may allow uh, web traffic in, and then that gets shuffled off to the proper location internally. Um, which is where principle of least privilege comes in. So the idea behind principle of least privilege is, is pretty simple. Um, you are allowed to get to the least, you have the, the privilege to get to only what you absolutely need. So I'm not gonna let you just have full access to my database. You're gonna be able to get into the web server and that's it. Um, this is normally not something that you see at the network level, or at least not a lot of people talk about it at the network level. This is usually a server-based thing. So uh, I have a login to a server. Um, I may be able to you know, run a command uh, as the user myself, but I, don't, I can't become root and run that command. So I don't have the power to do everything on the box. Or if there's something that needs to run, uh, I may be given access to run that, but everything else that's on the system, I'm not allowed to touch. Um, you can do this at the network level. Um, the, the simple, easy way to do it is just to use firewalls. So if you segment your network properly, build your firewall rules. Um, you know, we had the, the talk previously about um, the service, service level firewalls or the service-based firewalls, um, where instead of using all these core firewalls, you can do localized firewalls on the systems themselves. This is sort of complementary, at least the way that we're looking at it. So for instance, on our DMZ, we allow web traffic in, and that's it. Well, our, our network is set up in such a way that those uh, DMZ servers, the caching servers that we have, have to be able to get to the backend web servers. So we just open up all of the, all of the web traffic on 80 and 443 to those web servers. We're not doing individual uh, rules, we just do a big, simple rule that says, yeah, the web servers live here, so just allow web traffic in. And we do that for all of the different places that need to have you know, general level access, and then you can add in additional uh, rules on top of that to fine grain things if necessary. So if you have very, very sensitive uh, servers somewhere deep in the network, you can put those, those very fine grain rules in. But otherwise, you just use a general rule, and then you depend on those server level firewalls, IP tables or you know, whatever you're running um, to do the, the fine grained stuff on the server itself. Um, and is this really least privilege? Yes and no. Um, like I said, we're giving it a broad rule. We're saying allow all the web traffic. So it may be that I already have a server on the back end that is a web server but doesn't use AD and 443. Well, those ports are still going to be open in the firewall to it. But we're, we're relying on pushing that firewall traffic out to the edge and letting the edge servers run it. So that way the core stays nice and clean on a firewall level. It's very easy to manage. And then you have, you know, IP tables has become powerful enough to, to handle that sort of thing. Um, so this is the audience participation part again. Um, so any other thoughts on, on least privileged networks, network wise? Um, any, other, any other ideas on on what we can do there. Okay, so, um, right, so you can do MAC address filtering. Um, VLAN wise, what we, what we typically do VLAN wise is, is that's where our, our network segmentation comes in. Um, so we would have, uh, you, can, you can segment them out for say user networks down to, um, so that you have like a, say a, a an admin network. And then inside of that admin network, you do VLANs per building. So you still have a, a smaller uh, subnet you're, that you're dealing with in all those buildings. Um, it also gives us the ability to shut those down if we need to. So if we have uh, an outbreak of some sorts, you know, I work at a college, so if we have students that are suddenly infected with something, I can go out and say shut down, shut down that student network in that building without having to affect all of the other buildings that are across campus. So VLANs is another way to, to, to handle that. Any other thoughts? Uh, he was asking about SSH. 
SSH? Yeah, what about separating by SSH and allowing based on what your SSH is? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Basically, if someone tries to connect by SSH, separating out what they're allowed to do based on what their SSH key is associated with. Okay, so key-based authentication on the on the servers. Um, monitoring is another another area of network building that some people. Uh, not generally thought of as part of the building of the network itself, um, but it's still uh, a, a good, strong piece that you need in order to build a good network. Um, so uh, I absolutely think this is part of, of network building. Um, without the monitoring piece, it's, I mean, this is what's going to give you the insight into what's going on in your network. Um, properly set up and, and, and rolled out, um, you're going to be able to get real-time information, you will get historic information. Um, it becomes really useful for troubleshooting when you start having problems. Um, you know, I said historical data. Um, and it's really good for security because those are the logs that we use to figure out, well, why did that server get hacked? You know, wh where did that attacker come from? Um, so <clears throat> what can we use to monitor our network? So this is where I get into some of the, the tools and whatnot that are out there. Um, one of my favorites is, is Rancid. Um, is everybody, anybody here familiar with Rancid? So Rancid is this, <laughs> this great tool that uh, sits in the background and just goes to all of your routers, switches, and whatever else you've written to allow it to get into. Um, by default, it's usually uh, Cisco stuff. Uh, I think it supports Juniper. Uh, we have it supporting some Aruba stuff. Um, but in general, it goes out and it starts pulling those configs down. Now, it's great as a backup, and that's, that's useful. Um, but what we find even more useful is that this sends us diffs every time there's a, there's a change on the network. So whether we made it or it was a dynamic change made by, uh, you know, like the, the 802.1x system or, or, you know, somebody came and made a change or misconfigured something, we get all the diffs on this, and it happens at a, on a constant basis. So this is this is one of our, our one of the tools that we find absolutely invaluable. Um, when you're dealing with uh, uh, VLANs and 802.1x, NAC, that sort of thing, um, this actually shows us um, on occasion we can see where where VLANs have flipped into networks and kind of look at it and go, wait a minute, that's a student building. Why is suddenly somebody there connecting to the faculty network? So this this helps us out a little bit. Um, SNMP is another big one. This is what we use to monitor a lot of, or all of the routers and, and a lot of the other devices that we have. Um, SNMP has been around a long time. It's really, really easy to use. Uh, you can get a lot of data with it. Uh, the other side of SNMP is when you have the different pieces of equipment telling you what to do, telling you what's going on. So traps come in. Um, this is really handy for uh, uh, data centers when things start to get hot because somebody forgot to change the filters on the on, on the uh, the air conditioning. Um, so we've had a number of times that traps have come in and said, you know, hey, things are a little hot in here. You go running in at eight o'clock at night and say, wow, air conditioner's off. That's probably not a good thing. Uh, ping, is this thing up or not? Um, we use this more with, I mean, it's great for troubleshooting, but this is, this is a, the basic building block for any sort of monitoring system. Uh, you know, Nagios is, is a great monitoring system, and by default, a host, is, that's how it tells if it's up. Can you ping it? Yes, no. When it goes down, you can't ping it anymore. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's one of the really simple, easy tools that exists everywhere. And syslog, because logging is good. Um, syslog is, syslog can be a handful. Um, you can get, kind of get to be careful uh, depending on how much logging you're actually doing. Um, and trying to go through those logs is, can be a bear. Um, there's a lot of really good logging software out there. Um, let's see, uh, stuff like Graylog, um, Splunk. Um, I mean, you've got commercial, you've got non-commercial open source stuff. Uh, a lot of really good stuff out there. Um, what do you guys use for monitoring things? I mean, is there anything? Awesome by Alien Bulk. 
awesome, O S S I M. Okay. Right. I have grades IDS, IPS, Islam, SMMP, IOS, just point stuff at Yeah, I've seen that mentioned a lot on the uh, the the OSEC. Um, it takes an OSEC. Yeah. Water yeah. Wireshark's a nice one um, for doing real doing stuff with you sitting there. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen Wireshark automated. I mean, Netflow. Netflow, yep. Which I thought I had in here actually. Um, yeah, Netflow is actually a really good one. Um, it, you have the most of the uh, ability to identify everything that's going on without having to actually capture all those packets. So. Um, NetFlow is something that, that we're rolling out and, and really looking into. SolarWinds? SolarWinds as a, uh, well, they have a whole suite of, of tools. So everything from network monitoring is like a, uh, what is? Orion. Orion. Yes, Orion. Um, so the security piece of this is, is all of the stuff that we've built in thus far through the whole process of building the network. Um, you've, got your, your, you've got network segmentation, you've taken all of those disparate units and, and put them into their own networks, isolated their traffic. Um, you've used firewalls to make sure that they can't get to uh, those remote locations that they're not supposed to. So your web servers can get to your databases, but your, you know, your desktop tech support people can't. Uh, you've got monitoring place, uh, we've built that in right from the start, so we have a whole monitoring suite that's that's able to to look at all of everything that's going on and reporting back to us, and we've got the logging to back it up. So, what else? I mean, you know, I threw this together. Um, this is a lot of what we do, um, and I'm I'm interested. In, you know, the the previous talk that we that we had here about. Uh, um, the, the system security was, was really good. I've got a lot of ideas on using Chef and everything now, so I'm looking for more ideas from, from everybody. So is anybody else doing other stuff out there that? I, I have a question actually about your network. Since you're in, you're in a college, which is unique, um, in, in an office, mm -hmm. if I break my machine, my boss gets flagged, that's a bad thing. Colleges like to break other machines because it's either a joke or you know, one down the line. Besides VLANs, what other things do you do to you know, prevent, <coughs> let's say, my machine or me from kind of just running around the network, infecting things, or possibly breaking areas that shouldn't really be going into? The so um, this is the first college network that I've. Uh, worked in, and uh, they've explained to me numerous occasions that we are unique in that we actually monitor that sort of stuff. Um, we do what we can to prevent that. Um, so we have central systems that are managing desktops. Um, we want to get better at it, but we have that in place now. Um, the lab machines and whatnot are locked down, um, and they're they're frozen. Um, you know, I'm not on the desktop side, so I'm not entirely certain how they do this, but they're frozen in such a way that when you reboot the machine, it, it rebuilds it from an image. So even if you've taken that machine out or installed like a whole bunch of software on it, when it reboots, it's all back to, to uh, you know, whatever it was when it started. Um, they're doing, uh, they're starting to do patch management, push to the desktops. Um, the, it, there's, there's different areas where we're allowed to do things. And, and we want to do things, and then there's then there's the students, which we have no control over. So we kind of isolate those over here, put a big firewall over there, and say, don't touch anything. <laughs> so you, know, you can't really go into a computer that you don't own. Like, the college has no dominion over those machines. So we can't touch them. Um, we do um, our 802.1x NAC system. Um, we don't allow like rogue access points. We, you, you have to register everything that gets onto the network. Um, so even down to like uh, Xbox, PS3, that sort of stuff. Like all of that has, we have a system to go through and, and to check on all of that and make sure that that's, that's what it is. Do you have a way to uh, prevent somebody from uh, duplicating an app address and just go on? Um, yes and no. I mean, not really. Um, 
there are so there. I listen on the traffic, and I, I see an address that actually talks to the traffic. I know they're registered. All I have to do is knock them off and go in with that network. Right. The, the only place that I've really seen any of that is more on the wireless side. I mean, the um, the switches are, you know, you, you have to, you can sniff broadcast traffic. So, I mean, you can you can grab something that's on your local subnet. But, of course, if you're sniffing on your local subnet, you're already in that network. So, I just, I sniff somebody else's MAC address. That's somebody who's already on that network. Um, we're not allowed allowing broadcasts through to other VLANs. So if, if you're on the student network, you're not going to see traffic from the, you know, the, the faculty network. Um, I mean, there's there's ways to get their MAC addresses. I, I'm, I'm not saying that we're you know there's any any way to prevent that at this point. Um, so we don't have a solution for that. Um, we're trying to get better at it, but um, it's not an easy it's not an easy problem. I don't know. I, I personally don't know of a solution for it. I'd like to find one, but um, fortunately, we haven't had a lot of problems with it. Um, we've never really had, to our knowledge, had an issue where that's happened. Um, we have people who end up, uh, you know, you'll have a, a machine that they're building that they put out there, and then, um, you know, the person who's in charge of the machine is supposed to come over and log into it and make sure that it's all set up and everything, and somebody else gets to it first and logs in, and now it's on the wrong network. So that happens all the time. But um, Again, those are those. We usually figure that out pretty quick because they end up on the student network and can't do anything. For the internet two one X on the wired side, you doing eight two one X? Um, we're we're starting to do eight zero two one X on the wired side. The plan is to roll it out on wireless as well. Um, this is an area of active research for us, if you will. I mean, we're still learning some of the the pieces of this, but. So you're looking at RFC thirty five eighty. Attributes or layer two ACL? Um, I believe it's the former. This is, you know, the, on the. It, it's it's still very new, so I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, I know, from what I'm told on the the 802.1x side on the wireless, um, what they're they're able to do for us on the wireless side is exactly the same thing that we're doing on the wired. So once once it identifies the user, even though it's the same SSID, it's, it VLANs everybody apart. So they're going to have a, they're actually going to have a student role there or a, a faculty role, et cetera. Uh, what about like application level, level uh, redundancy? For example, if someone takes down a service and other services take over. So we're actually working on that now. We have a, um, we're, we're almost <laughs> we're almost fully virtualized at this point. So, um, taking down a service and being able to sp spin another one up is is pretty quick right now. Um, we don't have anything that's automatically doing it, but we actually have uh, the on the system side. The guys are looking at a way to to identify a service that has gone down and, and bring the up, bring it up over here and then actually for, because depending on how it's taken down. I mean, if it's a some sort of a DOS attack um, on that server. You know, you can bring it up over here. The traffic's just going to move because you have the same IP address. So they're they're looking at how can we dynamically move IPs and, and change things like that. Right. So um, I don't have anything. I mean, OSIC, depending on what it is, OSIC can block some of this for us. Automatic detect and block it based on the the rules. The uh, the scripts that are running. So if it detects enough traffic or, or uh, whatever whatever pattern that we're using to detect that, we can actually have that feedback into a rule or into a uh, a program that will go out and block it on the routers or block it on the switches. Um, it's a little bit more advanced than than we're dealing with now, but it's called OSIC. OSIC. It's a host-based intrusion detection tool, All right. or it's kind of a hybrid. IDS IPS. So it's it's not a hundred I mean when you talk about an IPS or at least the, the marketing speak for most IPSs that I've heard is that it will stop it in transit and that traffic will never get to your server. So in that respect, it doesn't work that way because the traffic has to have gotten there and created logs or you know whatever it's looking at to identify it. Um, but it's usually within, d depending on what the severity is, it's usually within one or two uh, packets that it actually is able to block it. Out of curiosity, do you know of any open source IPS? 
OSIC is OSIC, oh, open source IPSs? Yeah. Um, Snort's the one that usually pops up. All right. Did you have a, anyone else? So um, in the beginning I talked about um, all the, the fancy toys that we have now, the DLPs, the, the, uh, um, you know, the WAFs, the DPI stuff. Um, this is the end of the whole um, building exercise. So unless you have a need to put this sort of thing in immediately based on you know, some sort of a re uh, requirement that you're under, um, this is the sort of thing that you look at at the very end. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of this stuff is not necessary. It's, it's buzzwords that are thrown out there. They don't necessarily do what they're supposed to. They're usually very, very expensive. Um, so you have to look at these with a critical eye and, and kind of identify, is there a better way to do this? Um, for us, for uh, a lot of these different tools, we end up using open source um, tools for this, whether it's uh, something like mod security for you know, like a, a web application firewall or uh, OSIC for a host-based host intrusion detection. Um, you know, there's, there's parallels on both sides. Um, so you know, I kind of caution people against you know, getting all this stuff. When I, when I started, um, I started after they had done a complete forklift build, rebuild in the network um, where I was. And as part of that, that rebuild, they got every fancy toy that was out there um, and since then, we've basically removed all of them because they don't do what they're supposed to. Or, uh, in a lot of cases, it does what it's supposed to, but it's you, you end up spending most of your time trying to manage that device. Um, IDSs are really, really noisy, and especially when you're dealing with a small team, there's just, there's not enough time to deal with those. So. Um, these are, these are things that are kind of neat to look at and you can get ideas from. And, and I would recommend looking at them and identifying what they do and seeing how they fit in your network and then look and see if there's some better way to do that. Um, there's, there's no silver bullet. There's a lot of different ways to do things. But if you build from uh, the start to be secure and to segment things out and, and put all of that in place, it works out a lot better. So. That's pretty much all I have. Um, this slide deck will be up on my site later today. Um, as soon as I get myself some internet access. Um, <laughs> any questions? Comments? You know, throw things at me, et cetera. Is there, do you have any suggestions for like building a virtual lab practice? Um, Sort of. So if you're going to build, if you're going to, it, most of what I deal with is networking. So on the networking side, virtual labs become sort of a problem when you're trying to figure out the networking piece of it. There's a decent piece of software, uh, open source software called Quagga. It used to be called Zebra. You can actually do, it's a, basically build a router out of a Linux box. Um, so if you build yourself a couple of those nodes, and then you can actually use VLANs, depending on what, what, um, what virtualization you're using. I'm sorry? Quagga, it's Q U A G G A. Q U A G G A. Right. Um, it gives you a Cisco-like interface. Um, we've used we've used it for BGP. Um, I, I think it supports some basic routing protocols. RIP. It might do. Does it do it? OSPF? Yeah. Yeah. It's gotten a little bit more advanced since the last time I used it. Anything else? One last one, primarily around uh, your monitoring. Uh, I'm not familiar with the state of Delaware regarding uh, dual party consent I'm from Densi, which requires dual party consent to do monitoring of uh, network traffic. As a educational institution, uh, do you all have any, uh, as far as your choices for technologies employed, do you all have any concerns regarding the privacy of the students on the long slides? We don't. We we don't have we don't worry about it generally um, because we're not doing packet captures on a on a full time basis. So I'll pull I'll pull cap, packet captures when I need to, but not not on a, a normal day to day. That's we're we're expecting to be able to use NetFlow for that. Um, and from what I understand in the way that that NetFlow works, because you're not actually seeing the the content of what's. I mean, I can see that you went to Playboy. I can probably guess what you did, but I don't have the exact uh, packets to tell you what, what, what that transaction was. 
that's covered. Uh, you know, we don't have to worry about it. Right. 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 And then we're we're also a private school, so um, basically when they come in, it's you know, we don't have to. It, yeah, it's it's kind of a consent thing. Like, we don't look at your mail. We can look at your mail, but you know, I really don't care. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Any other questions? So thank you. I'm around. I'll be here tomorrow as well. If anyone wants to chat. So, thanks.